So I'm going to have a quick introduction, and this is the first time I've taken this particular approach on this, so I would appreciate any feedback. Um, I've tried to couch it in technologies and approaches and disciplines that you are already using, in most cases, as a way of motivating the approach, uh, which on its surface seems very strange, but through this path I'm trying to make it seem less strange. Then I'll take a very brief time to introduce the Resource Description Framework, which is a W3C standard for just sharing information in a networked environment, uh, where that network environment can be your organization or the entire internet and, and web. It's designed to scale um, in both cases. And then I'll end with uh, an introduction to the, the concept of the linked data project and talk a little bit about its successes. And then in the next talk, uh, Martin is going to talk about how IBM kind of came at this from another direction, which was we have this problem of integrating data in all of our products and services, and we don't really know how to do it well, and people are yelling at us for not doing it well, what do we do? And he ended up with these technologies. So he'll be talking about some more applied approaches and some cautions and considerations as well. So, when sharing information, we require a context. We need to know how to interpret it, we need to know how to serialize it, we need to know you know, what does this information mean? And if it's thrown at you without any kind of context, you have no idea what to do with it. So there's this general idea that data is raw and information is data that has been put in relation to other information. It's been contextualized somehow. And then suddenly we had too much information. So then knowledge is contextualized, prioritized information. So now we're at the pro problem where our knowledge is too, too voluminous and we need some ways of handling it. But if I say to you that this data that I just threw up there had something to do with me, as people with a shared understanding and culture and everybody has one of these, you'd be able to guess. Somebody would be able to guess? Birthday. It's my birthday. And if I say that's what it is, every single person in this room has a birthday, every single person in this room understands what I mean, and that's sufficient. But if I wanted to do this, if I wanted to share this information in a machine processable way, without using Facebook, how <laughs> could I do it? And that's just a weird problem that we haven't really run into much because we tend to think in terms of code. Oh, I'll write some code and I'll, I'll write a service and I'll invoke a service and I'll do some integration. And a large part of what we've been doing has been pushing this burden of integration into the application developers, particularly once they start spanning multiple data sources. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. So where do we do our data integration? Obviously in our databases. So I could start to create a table for people and capture <coughs> things like a unique identifier, a name, and a date of birth. And what's interesting about these identifiers is these, this number, 1234, is guaranteed to be unique within this database. But even between multiple instances of the same data store, that number could be repeated. It's not a, a unique number. Brian is an Irish name. Sletten is a Norwegian name. Um, and, you know, we tried to conquer the UK a couple of years ago. Never really happened. So there's not a lot of Brian Sletten's running around. But I do know that there is at least one more in the US. Um, and he has reviewed every Star Trek episode ever. And that's not me. I, I like Star Trek, but that's going a little bit too far. So we understand that there's a context to how we're capturing this information in terms of both the structure of the data, what's useful to us, what are we trying to capture, what are we trying to share, and then now everything that fits within this table is going to have to fit into that structure. And the context of this table is going to be scoped to just our use because there's no identity that, that moves beyond it. That being said, this is how we, we've been doing things for 40 years now, and we're able to take a table, and we're able to map it into some kind of object through Hibernate or something like that, and then we're able to put that object into some kind of component, a library of some sort, and then we're able to deploy that library component to a computer. It's what we do. But I want you to remember this chain this structure of the information that gets mapped into an object, that gets mapped into a component, that gets mapped to a deployed system, and then think about how do we change things? How do we add things? How do we 
bring in other sources of information. And it all has the same dependency problem. It all has the same set of uh, upstream dependencies that if we make changes there, we end up ma making changes here, which could break things, could cause unexpected results, and that's generally problematic. So our software tends to be a little fragile, a little brittle, and when we deploy things into large organizations, we kind of have to have everybody agree all at once what things are going to mean. And that doesn't scale very well. Along the way, about 10, 10 15 years ago, we started thinking, all right, we can be smarter than this. We don't have to deploy all the code everywhere. I can put some kind of behavior in a component and invoke it over the, you know, the network. So I can say, hey, give me the identity for this, like, give me the name for this ID, or give me the birthday for this ID. And then reality hit, and we realized that these remote procedure calls, you know, this granularity are kind of bad. So we started thinking larger in terms of, all right, well, I'm going to invoke a query. I'm going to define a custom message that's going to say, please go out and get me this person object and bring it back to me. And I'll pull back enough that I don't have to hit the same service over and over and over again to get individual pieces. I'll just get the majority of the information I want and get it back as XML. And this was a huge step forward. It did minimize some of the dependencies, but everything is still pretty tightly coupled through contracts and whatnot. So in this, in this context, we saw the emergence of a different way of doing this, known as REST, where rather than writing custom messages to ask for information, we use a semantically meaningful action that means, hey, I'd like to see this thing, and we give that thing a name. And one of the things that I think as developers we don't give enough credit to is the fact that these names are unique in a global context, but they're also a handle. So it's name as identifier and name as handle. If you have the name of the thing, you know how to interact with it. You pull on it and you retrieve information. In this case, maybe the XML representation of a person. Well, web application developers don't particularly like XML. That's fine. We have the ability in this infrastructure, because of the separation of the name and the form that it takes, the ability to accommodate people who want to see it as JSON, or as an Excel spreadsheet, or as an HTML document, or some other format. So we have the capacity, and this is basically what we would call a level two RESTful system. It has support for information resources. It has support for HTTP as an application protocol for manipulating those resources. Perhaps we support content negotiation. And most things that you see labeled as REST are about this level of sophistication. If you want to update information about the person, you can put or post information back. If you wanted to remove a person, uh, that sounds bad, but you know, if it's an employee or something like that, you could issue a delete request to that thing and it would go away. But the interesting thing about this is it doesn't matter what type of information we're talking about. The web works the same regardless of whether you're logging into your bank, logging into some kind of chat room or board or <coughs> excuse me, news, uh, a news site or sports scores, it doesn't matter because the resource abstraction uh, encompasses all of it. And what we want to do is to start moving in this direction where this resource abstraction and the ability to sh change the shape of the information <coughs> allows us to apply this predictably across a wide variety of information accounts and orders and regulations and documents and all kinds of stuff. But to be fully proper level three REST, um, we need to have linkage. We need to have the hypermedia. We need to be able to follow our nose from one document to another, just like the web works. Again, the web is not a single document. It's a document that connects you to another document that connects you to another document and, you know, try to find the end. You, you won't. So here I can imagine a person, maybe that attends a school, has a link with a relationship type of school, and from there, on the client, I can discover the connection. Unlike how a lot of people build RESTful systems, I'm not building up the URL to, to invoke this. I'm finding it in the body of what I get back. I follow my nose, and then I end up in uh, some kind of information resource about the school. And from there, I can maybe find the admissions department. And from the admissions department, I could find the forms to submit information to apply to the school. 
And this roughly represents the state of the art for most organizations in terms of the adoption of these technologies, web-oriented RESTful technologies, uh, in the management and manipulation uh, of their information. I could spend hours talking just about this stuff, but there are limitations to what this does for us. It's a huge step forward, but we run into some problems, particularly once we start thinking about multiple forms of information and multiple data sources and what, where this information comes from and how we combine it. If we start to think about specific types of people, you can imagine a student is a type of person, and so in object-oriented programming, we can very easily imagine extending that class and adding new capabilities down here. So up here, we're managing names and date of births and things like that. Down here, we've got student identities and GPAs, uh, grade point averages, and what year they are. Are they a freshman, sophomore, third year, fourth year, whatever? This makes sense to us in the object-oriented world. This is why we use objects, because we want to reflect uh, the reality. However, remember we're putting all of our data in tables, and tables expect things to be a certain shape, and the, everything has to be that same shape. So we have to introduce a new table to capture portions of the, the student that are now separate from the person, and then we have pointers between them, but we still can do it. We have multiple tables representing the multiple aspects, we have multiple mappings, and we can reify that information into a student into an object model, or even into a new RESTful endpoint. A resource as a student that has its own identity um, where I can blur the distinction between those tables on the back end. I can collapse all that information into a single resource and say, when I view this information as a student, I want to have a single view, and I want to know their name, their date of birth, their GPA, and their year. Again, we can do this. And this is a huge leap forward in terms of clients not having to care how you store your information. And when you can separate them from having to care about that, then your capacity to adopt Mongo and Cassandra and all these other great new technologies on the back end makes this even easier. Because nobody really cares about whether you're using a document model or a key value pair. That's up to you. And that's how you organize your information, how you store it, how you search it, end users don't care. That is an implementation detail, not something that anybody really cares about, other than you have the capacity and the, the growth potential to manage the amount of information that they want. So we can blur those distinctions and give people composite views, regardless of where the data comes from. However, it doesn't scale. We can't keep doing this. If we start talking about employees as a type of person and say, all right, well, Employees have names and date of births as well, and they also have employee IDs and supervisors and salaries. And so now we have another table that captures that information, maps that in. And if we want to talk about student employees, it just starts getting crazy. And the problem is, if we think about this structure, and we think about the dependencies between the schemas, which are fixed snapshots in time, normalized into a particular structure, good for processing, not good for modeling. Good for requesting and storing, not good for reasoning over. So we have to end up writing a lot of custom software because as useful as the relational model is, it doesn't mean anything. What, what, what does EID mean? What does SID mean? What does salary mean? We have to write that meaning into custom code, into custom mapping, into custom objects to be able to, to use it. When we control everything, that's fine. When everything can fit into our data store, that's fine. But once we start crossing data sources and domain boundaries and where the information comes from, it's game over. The data model that we've been using no longer works. If I wanted to overlay social networking information, how do we do this? Well, if we were forced to use a data model, we would have to do an ETL and extract a transformation and load all of that social information into another data store that, that, that then fits into our model. We can't do that. We can't take all of the world's information and consume it and hoard it and hold on to it just so that we can interact with it, that we can connect it, that we can integrate it. So we need a better way of managing this, particularly because we still have this problem. As we make changes, as we move things around, as we integrate stuff, it has this cascading approach in terms of how stuff is interpreted, how code is deployed, versioning, 
etc. All right. So what does what does this all mean? We have this idea of a resource as a thing. It can be a document. It can be a document about the weather. It can be a document about news. It can be a document about you. It can be a document about your organization. A resource is just a conceptual uh, way of representing something that we care about. And so we can take this resource abstraction and we can say, all right, we have a resource that we'll call one, two, three, four for right now. And what I have here is an encoding of certain properties about that resource. And that encoding relies on the fact that XML is a tree structure and I can embed things hierarchically. And so that I tend to interpret those things as these are attributes associated with this outer element. But this is, all, this is just syntax. This is just an expression of a particular worldview that I then have to write code to interpret. This is why XML did not solve all of our problems. It required us to agree on what these things meant. And on a point-to-point -point basis, you know, you and I can agree, and you and I can agree, but there's no way we're all going to agree. And so everybody's constantly you know, doing these one-offs and everything. It's just it's not going to scale. But what's being expressed here is not all that complicated. The thing called one, two, three, four is a person. That's a fact that I would like to capture. The thing called one, two, three, four has a name. The thing called one, two, three, four has a date of birth. The thing called one, two, three, four is connected to this other thing called two, four, eight. These all follow this sort of propositional statement form. Something is connected to a value through some kind of relationship. It just so happens that historically, we have used a table structure to represent that. Something, this row, is connected to this value through this relationship. The relationship is the column name. The identity is generally the candidate key, or the primary key. And then the values are what are in the cells through that relationship. So we can see that a table structure and a tree structure are interesting, but insufficient. I can't take two tree structures and shove them together and still have a tree. I can't take two tables and arbitrarily shove them together. I have to sort of come up with some normalized ways of mapping them together into a larger table structure. But what we're trying to say is really not that difficult. We're just trying to say, here are some facts, here are some entities, here are some attributes, here are some values, and I'd like you to be able to consume them. And if there are entities that are not captured here, like your favorite color, or your blood type, or your favorite band, or where you were born, or just any kind of arbitrary piece of information, then why is that so hard? Why do we have to write custom object models, custom schemas, custom mapping to learn one more thing? And the really distrust, the disturbing part is all the real value opportunities in these things comes from the unexpected. In terms of business opportunities, and scientific research, and market opportunities, and catching terrorists and things like that. It's the, huh, that's strange kinds of things that we would like to be able to do. And if our data model forces us to say, all right, everybody's going to have this structure in order for you to efficiently process it, this is not good. And this is, this is limiting our capacity. If I look at the more complex composite model here, I have two identities. There's the student identity and the person identity. But because I've equated them through a foreign key relationship, I can just pick one. And as, lo as long as I understand the context in which I'm using it, then either one applies, right? All the facts that come from the one table are associated with it. All the facts from the other table are also associated with it. So I'm just going to pick the person one, because I think personness is a more uh, higher abstraction than studentness. And I could say, this is a person. This person has a name, this person has a date of birth, is linked to something, is a student, has a GPA, is a senior, has a blood type, has a friend, was born here, watched this movie. The point is I can just keep saying things. And really what I'm talking about is capturing a graph structure. If I have this thing represented as a resource, I can say this thing is a person, and this thing is a student, and this thing has these values. And oh, by the way, this thing is connected to this other thing. And a graph structure is much easier to capture arbitrary relationships about. That's why we're seeing things like Neo4j being so successful 
and very efficiently capturing arbitrary information because this graph structure makes it very easy for us to just learn new things. Now, there are scale issues and replication issues, and even at the end of the day, we still aren't going to put all of the world's information or even all of your organization's information into one place. So we need to have a larger context than just a single graph, a single identity space. And we've already seen an example of something that works really well that way. The notion of a URL as a global, disambiguable, resolvable identifier is a very compelling idea for assigning identity to resources. Not only is it resolvable, you've never seen it before, pull on it. You'll, you'll, you'll get some representation of it. But the interesting property about global identifiers is they are completely portable. Every single person in here could come up with a global identifier, could strain to a domain that you have control over. I can't publish into your domain, you can't publish into my domain, but I can take all of these identifiers that everybody puts together, drop them in a bucket, shake them up, and there's no concern about collision. That is incredibly empowering. That is incredibly freeing, because now what's in your database and what's in your database and what's in your database can be commingled at an entity level, and there's no concern about conflict. So, I'm going to use the kind of XML QName representation here, because otherwise these graphs get ugly and hard to read. So in the res namespace, I'm going to point that to some particular URL predicate, and then I'm going to talk about res1234 as HTTP colon slash slash server resource slash 1234. This entity now has unique identity in a global context. <laughs> And I could say, all right, this resource is connected to that resource. That's pretty cool. But we still have this problem about the attributes and the relationships. What can we do to improve the situation there? Is there any reason we couldn't also use URLs to refer to those? Absolutely not. And as it turns out, there are lots of these collections of resource identifiers for concepts and terms and relationships and classes. They're generally bundled into something called a vocabulary and published on the web. And one of them is called friend of a friend, FOF. And in the friend of a friend namespace, grounded at xmlns.com slash FOF slash a particular version, 01, there is a term called name. And it probably means what I want it to mean as far as capturing the name. So I don't have to come up with a new relationship. I can just use theirs. And unlike a lot of XML schemas and object models and things like that, where you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound, I mean, if you are committed to that schema, if that was the only thing I wanted to use from that vocabulary, that's the only thing that, you know, I choose to use. Nothing else matters. If I use this term somehow, and you've never seen it before, you can pull on it, because it's a URL. And you can find a human readable description of what this relationship means. The name is unique, it's global, it's resolvable. You pull on it, you find out what it means. But it's also available in a machine processable way. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about that, but I can pull down a description of what this resource means <coughs> in the resource description framework. RDF is used to describe itself, which is a little bit difficult right after, you know, the first cup of coffee in the morning, I meaning a couple more cups of coffee. But the point is, there's no separation between schema information and instance information like we have in databases. Databases have a schema, and then we load data into that schema. XML documents have schemas, then we have instance documents that we load into those schemas. In this model, everything is a resource, so we can describe everything, including the relationships. I can say this resource is a functional property. And if you understand what that means, then you can enforce, if I say name is a functional property, or birthday is a functional property, and I say Brian's birthday is May 26th, Brian's birthday is May 27th, you can use custom tools, I mean, sorry, standard tools, 
to enforce constraints over custom environments. Because it doesn't know what a birthday is, but it knows you're not allowed to have two of them. It doesn't know what is in as a relationship means. But it knows that it's a transitive relationship. And a transitive relationship propagates across the graph. So if Brian is in this room, and this room is in Aarhus, and Aarhus is in Denmark, Brian is in Denmark. Standard modeling language, standard reasoning language, standard query language, arbitrary domains. And that's where this stuff, stuff really starts to get powerful. So I'm going to use the name property from FOF, and I'm going to use the birthday property from FOF, and this also tells us you know, it should be in the month, month, dash, year, year. And now I can say, all right, I have one Q name, res to the resource, another one called FOF that points to that, and now res1234 has a FOF name of Brian Sutton, and has a FOF birthday of that. RDF is described in terms of itself, so there's one called type in the RDF vocabulary, is a relationship called type that allows us to assert that a resource is an instance of a class. So if I look back at folk, I see that there's a class called person. And these again, this is just an organizing way of saying things that have similar properties. A person has certain properties, kind of like an object-oriented programming, although don't get too enamored to the similarity because there are some pretty serious differences. But now I can say with the RDF vocabulary and its namespace, res has a FOF name, a FOF birthday, and an RDF type of FOF person. So I'm able to reuse concepts from a domain that a bunch of people got together and described, social networking, talks about people, things they're interested in, where they work, where they went to school, how to contact them, who they know. So all that kind of stuff, I don't need to create new terms for that, I can reuse them. Now these other things, year, GPA, I don't know how to necessarily yet reflect that I'm attending a school. Maybe I can find a relationship for these things, maybe I can't. But the point is, I can just create one. I can go through and say, all right, these are the relationships that I want. And if five weeks from now, a year from now, I come across a more standard representation of these terms and relationships, that's fine. Because they are also resources, I can connect them. And I can say the one that I used a year ago and the one that I'm seeing now are the same relationship. And I can then, for all intents and purposes, forget the fact that I created my own and just start using the new ones. And anybody who knows the new ones can ask questions of my data as if I'm using the new industry standard. So there is almost really no bad choice that you can make because we can always fix it in the future. So I'm not going to go through and talk about coming up with their own terms of relationships. It's a, it's a whole set, separate set of skills. <coughs> but that would be the next um, approach. We would have relationships and classes for students and teachers and those kinds of things and connect a student into that. What I want to do now is show you this graph is sort of conceptual. It exists in some state, whether it's in a file or it's generated on the fly from a relational database or extracted from a document. It doesn't matter. People, understand, people always ask, like, well, where do you put this stuff? And I'm reminded of the, the joke by the American comedian Stephen Wright. He says, I've got the world's largest seashell collection. You may have seen it. I leave it on the beaches of the world. And that's the same with this information. We, we're so fixated on big data stores and putting everything into one data store. That only goes so far. Right? Beyond that, we have to imagine all right, we've got some information here and some information over there, and I want to connect them. And because I'm connecting them using resolvable relationships and resolvable identifiers, the fact that it's over there is largely irrelevant. Obviously, there are some network latency issues, but we have ways of managing that as well. So consider that this is a conceptual relationship of all the information, and I don't care where it comes from, and I don't care how it's produced, and I don't care how it's stored. As needed, I will resolve these pieces and do something with them. Now, one way that we can do this is to serialize that graph in a particular format. And this is a particularly hated format called RDF XML, um, because when they did it, everything had to be XML. So the problem here is putting a graph structure into a tree 
is a painful process. And so we end up with a lot of ceremony about this, but we still see we're talking about resource one, two, three, four. It's an instance of a person class. Oh, what's, which class is that? Go resolve it, go find it out. It has a name, it has a birthday. Here's a, a more human friendly serialization called Turtle. It's the terse RDF triple language. It's the same information, it's losslessly converted from one form to another, but it's easier for us to, to see exactly what we're talking about. None of that uh, ceremony nonsense. So we, we have a way of serializing all of these facts in some format, whether they're stored natively on a file at a location like this, or we content negotiate a REST API into RDF, or convert it on the fly. There's a W3C standard called R2RML that uh, shows you how to convert relational databases into RDF on the fly. The data stays where it is, but when you ask for it, it can be reified as RDF. So let's assume I have a file at this location, and as it turns out, I do, um, with this in it. This is a self-contained RDF XML document that captures three facts. This thing, the person has a name, has a birthday. I can now run a query against it. So we use Sparkle. Sparkle is the Sparkle protocol and RDF query language. I'm only gonna focus on the query language part. I can do a query that says, give me all the subjects, all the predicates, and all the objects from that data source. Where, and I don't have any constraints. I'm just basically saying, tell me everything that's there. And so my Sparkle engine goes out, fetches that file, asks for it, determines that it's in a format, it knows how to parse, it's RDF XML, reads it in, and it doesn't know anything about birthdays or FOF or anything like that, but it's able to just accept. Whatever is in that document, it can accept. And here's the crazy thing. With these global identifiers for our entities and our relationships, any RDF system can consume RDF from any other RDF system. Try that even within the same relational database with slightly different schemas. Okay? It's not going to work. Any RDF system can consume data, that even that it's not expecting. Say I go through and I add information about bands and blood types and music and stuff in, that, in there. The same query, using a standard query language, fetch the data, serialize it, discover all the new relationships, all the new subjects, all the new predicates, all the new values, even for things I've never seen before. And I go, what is this FOF name? Go resolve it, figure out what it is. I can now ask questions of the data. So here I'm, I'm not asking anything in particular, I'm just doing Star Trek, you know, computer, tell me everything about everything, which is not generally a useful query. I want to ask a more detailed query. In this case, I'm going to specify in the where block a graph pattern that I want to find in the graph. So I want to know the name and the date of birth, and I can call these variables whatever I want, from that same data set where the subject is connected to the name predicate, or name uh, value, through the FOF name predicate, and it's also connected to a date of birth through the FOF birthday predicate. Both facts have to be expressed in the graph in order to find a graph pattern that looks like that. But if once it does, it says, oh, okay, well, Brian has a birthday of May 26th. I have run a meaningful query against a remote data source and I may have never seen the data ever before in my life. But here's the thing. Here's where we get another leg up on REST. REST is cool for standardizing and making your infrastructure predictable, but it also puts the integration burden on the client. You give me XML, you give me JSON, I have to write custom code to do something with it. Whereas, if you give me RDF, and you give me RDF, simply by asking for it, select name and date of birth from this data source and from this other data source. As expressed, these two data sources are automatically converted into a single graph. And then I look for the same patterns in the graph. Maybe they connect, maybe they're separate, doesn't matter. I now find, oh, 
I've learned two things now. I don't know necessarily at this point which came from which. If I care, I can manage that. But the point is, it's a zero effort data integration if the information is available in this form. Of network available arbitrary domains using standard modeling languages, standard querying languages, standing reason reasoning language. This is incredibly powerful. Now, where is this RDF going to come from? Some of it's going to be native. People are storing this. There are, there are triple stores now for storing RDF triples. These subject, predicate, object relationships are expressed in terms of the triples, or are called triples. Um, or they could just be in a file. Or they can use, we can use content negotiation, give me information about the account, or give it to me as RDF. Now think about this for a second. If you're in the retail space and you have product information and you surface that product information as RDF, pricing, imagery, manufacturer, cost, those, you know, the image, that, that kind of stuff, and I have another data source over here that has ratings and reviews. As long as this information can be generated in RDF and we have a consistent way of referring to our entities, then I can just simply say, find the top rated consumer electronic devices by Sony um, that have at least three stars, rating stars. Data source over here, data source over here, automatically added, run a meaningful query over it. I'm not writing custom software to do this. Now, there's a lot more to this, right? I'm obviously having to brush over a lot of details, but that's entirely possible. We have the ability, so th in these cases, I'm pulling the data to me, which for large data sets, you can imagine, is pretty painful. So Sparkle endpoints are ways of allowing a data store to expose an API that allows